Good morning. Welcome to Lakewood Vineyard Church at Home. We're so excited to have you connected this morning or this evening. <laughs> I'm Sarah Myers, and um, again, we're just really glad to have you joining us today. Um, our vision at Lakewood Vineyard is for um, exactly that, for us to connect with one another, for us to experience God and explore our faith together, and then for us to also go out and love our world together. Um, so I hope as our service goes on, you're um, comfortable connecting in the comments, um, answering uh, the questions that are being asked during the sermon. And uh, again, we just look forward to connecting with you and we're glad you're here today. Speaking of connecting, we do have connect cards that we want to um, have you fill out if you're new to Lakewood Vineyard. So if this is your first time watching or your first time attending um, a service with Lakewood Vineyard, we would love um, to connect with you. So there's a link in the comments where you can do that or you can text LV Connect to 97000. Every connect card that we get for our first time um, for first time guests, um, we get to give $5 to the City Mission, which is an awesome partnership to have because they support a lot of different efforts throughout the city of Cleveland. What you can expect this morning is I'm going to share a few more announcements. We're gonna have um, our offering that we receive. We will get to worship with Alex, Dave, and Brian. And then Andy Sakura is gonna continue our Citizens in Exiles series today. And as I mentioned before, as Andy um, preaches the sermon, he'll have some questions for us that we would love um, to connect and answer those questions in the comments. After the sermon, we'll um, get to worship and ref reflect and pray a little bit together. And we'll close with communion. So if you are a follower of Jesus, we would love to have you grab bread or crackers and juice or wine and join us for that communion. If you have kids who are fifth grade or below, we do still have Vineyard Kids curriculum for them if you want to continue church at home with them. The way you can get that curriculum is um, by checking out lakewoodvineyard.com slash vineyardkids so that you can continue church with them too. Now we're going to receive our offering. We are so thankful for what the Lord has done for us and so we want to give that back. And the way that we do that at Lakewood Vineyard is by connecting and partnering um, through our offering. There's a couple of different ways that you can give. Uh, one is online, going to lakewoodvineyard.com slash give. You can also text to give any amount to 84321. And finally, if you like to mail it in snail mail style, you can um, mail it to our P.O. Box 770208, Lakewood, Ohio 44107.
bring life to dry bones. You bring life to dry lands. You bring life to dry hearts. We're so thankful to serve a God that is. So thankful to serve a God that is a God that brings new life, that brings resurrection to places, to things, to ideas, to people, to families, to hearts that were dead. You bring new life. You bring restoration. God, pray that for our friends here today, where there is a hope, where there is a dream that has uh, just become dried out and lifeless and dead, would you work a miracle of bringing resurrection to our lives? Demonstrate your greatness. are good and you are faithful and you are great. Love you, Lord. Amen. Well, hey, everyone. Matt, just wanted to say hi real quick um, and say thank you so much. Uh, for the outpouring of encouragement and love and prayers and even some gifts and food uh, since baby William was born June 26th. Aaron and uh, William are doing great and Esther is loving being a big sister. So thanks so much for your prayers and kind words. It means so much to us. Um, so just a few things uh, before we dive into our message. Um, first thing I wanted to share with you is that for the month of July, we're going to continue to have online services only. Online services only. Our original goal, we had, I mentioned one time we were hoping for some time in July, but just as we've looked at what we need to get together to, in order to resume in-person services, um, really get our ducks in a row uh, for your safety as well as to be able to really create an atmosphere and environment that's going to be um, conducive for worship as well as being able to continue to have an online presence. Uh, we're going to aim for uh, the beginning of August, but for the month of July, we're remaining online. But here's the exciting thing is we will have some opportunities to gather outside with one another. So community groups will have some times like that. We'll also be talking a little bit uh, in, sometime in mid-July. We'll be sharing about an opportunity for women to gather together outside uh, in a gathering as well as some other opportunities. So be on the lookout for that. We'll uh, be sending some emails out and some other messaging. So we're going to be gathering in different ways outside uh, during the month of July, just not on Sundays uh, for worship indoors. So wanted to let you know that if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at matt at lakewoodvineyard.com. But here's what I'm really excited about is this week, my friend Andy Sakura, he's a pastor of Renew Communities uh, in Berea. He's going to be giving the message in week three of our Citizens in Exiles series. And Andy is the uh, lead pastor of Renew Communities in Berea, a church that was planted in uh, spring of 2011. It's an incredible church uh, that's just made a real impact in Northeast Ohio and greater Cleveland. And, and they've really supported us as a church in significant ways, um, financially, but also with equipment as we had to move everything online. They've provided some technical expertise. They've allowed us to use their space uh, as well to do some recording. Um, so they've just been incredible encouragers along this journey of planting Lakewood Vineyard. But in addition to that, Andy personally has become just a dear friend of mine, uh, providing encouragement and um, some guidance even in church planting as they're several years ahead of us, but just a real friend, uh, just a man who I really trust and believe in in his heart for God and his heart for people and his love even for you, though he hasn't met most of you. Um, he really cares deeply about our church community. So he's going to be sharing uh, this week in our section on First Peter. And so I'd encourage you to, to listen um, as he shares uh, and really open your your heart to hear what God might have to say. Hey, I'm grateful to be with you. I'm grateful for the work that's happening with Lakewood Vineyard. We at Renew Communities are really uh, excited about what's happened in the short 
launched before a pandemic broke out, and then even what's happened since then and the community that's being built. I love Matt, and uh, we've gotten to be good friends. I've gotten to have lots of great conversation. We're really excited and cheering for and praying for what you guys are doing. I'm excited to be a part of this series, uh, Citizens in Exiles. It's interesting because our church is doing First Peter, and I actually know of about a half dozen churches uh, that I'm friends with that are doing First Peter. I think it's interesting because I think uh, God is speaking to to our church in this age, Renew, our church, but your church, Lakewood Vineyard, and churches all over about what it means to live this way now. You know, Peter is writing to these Christians scattered all over what is now modern day Turkey about what it means to live as citizens and exiles in that day. And yet today in our culture, 2020 America, the same things that Peter's speaking to them about I think he's speaking to us about the Lord is using it in interesting ways. And so I'm excited to get to share a little bit about what's on my heart, heart for this passage. So I'm going to pray for us and, uh, and then we will dig into this text together. Let's pray. God, we are grateful uh, that we have the opportunity to gather together online. We're grateful for technology that unites us, uh, that lets us be in lots of places, but one place at, at the same time. God, we know that your spirit transcends borders and boundaries, limitations that we can imagine. And so we just pray that your Holy Spirit would open our heart and our mind, our soul, our lives, our relationships to what you might want to say to us today through words that were written thousands of years ago to a time that's totally different today than it was then. God, we pray that you would still have your way in our life. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to read to you. It's 1 Peter 1, 13 through chapter 2, verse 3. It's, it's kind of a long haul, but just pay attention. It's good. It says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live your, your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have been purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you've been born again, not by perishable seed, but by imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and their, all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, I'm going to start with a story that feels disconnected, but watch how this works. So my wife and I have the weirdest conversations all the time. Most of the time it happens when we're traveling, when we're driving on a long road trip. We talk about things like, what would we do if we won the Mega Millions jackpot, even though we never play the Mega Millions jackpot? Or, or which rooms of our house would we remodel if we had the money to do it? And what things would we do? Or, or what countries we'd like to travel to the next time we're allowed to leave the country when this pandemic is over? One of the weirdest conversations we had while driving was one day when my wife turned to me and asked me who I thought the nicest people we knew were. Now, I just want to be clear. This wasn't her saying, don't you think those people are nice? And me going, yeah, those people are nice. No, it was like, let's make a top 10 list of the nicest people or kindest people we knew. Now, it may be weird to you to think about having that conversation, but it didn't take long for us before we had a few strong candidates and we were able to assemble a top, ten, top five list of the kindest people we know. 
These are people who came to help us when our basement had flooded and they had just gotten off their third shift, but they were still willing to come to our house at six in the morning and help us out. Or someone who will make a meal for every single person they know who just had a baby or is going through a difficult time, even though they too just had a baby. These people are so kind, right? Always caring. Whenever you engage with them, you think this person is a different kind of person because their level of kindness far exceeds mine and really every other human I've ever interacted with. And after each engagement with these people, you're left wondering, like, what is going on in a person that produces that level of kindness in their life? Their kindness is so unique, right? It's different. You notice it, that you know something is going on inside of them that makes them different. And I think most of what Peter is talking about in this section is about what's happening inside the heart of those whose lives are defined by Jesus and the heart of those whose lives aren't. But there's one outward characteristic that would be evident to all who knew them, right? The kindness or the lack of kindness. Look at verse 22. This is what he says. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Think of the words that Peter uses to describe the kind of love that that marks a person that's loving and kind. He's talking about this sincere love. Basically, there's no ulterior motives to the love that they're showing. The love is not self-serving. We've all encountered a love that's self-serving, right? We notice that. We feel that. But this is sincere love. He he says it's a deep love. The, The Greek word for deep can also mean earnest or fervent or even intense, like an intense love. And from the heart, or other translations say from a pure heart. So Peter says, love each other with a sincere, earnest, fervent, intense, pure heart or pure love. This kind of love is is the kind of love that can't go unnoticed when you encounter it. It's the kind of love that you experience and say, what is going on in a person that produces that level of love and kindness? The reason it stands out so much is because it stands in stark contrast to what comes to us naturally as human beings. In chapter 2, verse 1, he, he calls, Peter calls us away from these things. He says, rid yourself of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. I compare those two lists, right? Sincere, earnest, fervent, pure love, and then malice, the intention or desire to do evil to someone, or, or ill will, deceit, envy, slander, which is basically making false statements about a person to damage that person's reputation. Whenever we experience the deep love, we ask the question, what's going on in a person that produces that kind of love or kindness? The reality is, though, we ask the same question when we experience malice or ill will or deceit or hypocrisy or slander or envy. We see that kind of behavior and we think, what is going on inside of that person? Like, what what is happening in their heart that would cause them to act or react or treat someone the way that they do? And before we dive into what's going on inside of us, I want to talk just for a second about the places in relationships that you may be feeling those negative emotions right now. Like maybe you have a desire to do evil to someone. Maybe you wouldn't categorize it that way, but as you think about it, like there is ill will in your heart towards someone. Or maybe towards a group of people. Maybe you're deceitful or or you've been hypocritical or you're envious. You envy people. Maybe you speak poorly about someone and it's damaging their reputation at work or in the community. And and you kind of feel good about it because you think maybe they deserve it. Where in your life can you identify these emotions? What relationships are they the most evident? I want you to just be honest with yourself or as the Lord kind of pushes that to the front of your mind, be be willing to receive that kind of rebuke from him. Like this is where this exists in your life. And I want to ask a question. I'm going to give you a chance to talk about it in the chat. It's this, what causes us to want to treat someone else poorly? What causes us to want to treat someone else poorly? What causes us to want to do evil to another person? Why would there be malice or envy or ill will in our hearts? Why would we slander someone? What causes us to want to treat someone else poorly? Go ahead and chat about that uh, online here.
Okay, so there's something I believe specific taking place internally that fuels our actions, whether they're good or bad. Something is fueling the selfish negative behavior and something else is actually fueling the selfless love Peter's describing. Peter really gets to it right at the top of the passage. Listen again, he says this in verse 13. He says, therefore, with minds that are fully alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So I just want you to catch this. Both the love and the destruction come from where you're setting your hope. All right, I'll say it again. Both the love and the destruction come from where you are setting your hope. To set your hope on something means you believe it will provide you what you need. Right? And so Peter shows us the two places that you could be setting your hope right there at the beginning. He says you can set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Or you could set your hope on, uh, on the focus of your evil desires. So you can set your hope on Jesus and his grace or the so, uh, set your hope on the focus of your evil desires. So let's just focus first on Peter's calling to the Christians away from evil desires. And, and to do that, I know it's a quick turnaround back to another question to talk about in the chat, but, but I just want you to answer this question. What makes a desire evil? Like, think about evil desires. What makes a desire an evil desire? Go ahead and chat about that. Now, I would say to you that what makes a desire evil is the benefit, the cost, and the controller, right? If you get all the benefit while others receive no benefit, it's probably an evil desire. Or if it costs you nothing but costs others a lot uh, in a way that they have no control over, it's probably an evil desire. Or if you are the controller of both the cost and the benefit, there's a pretty good chance that your desire is rooted in evil because in the end it's self-centered. This is a lesson we learned from an early age. If you're going to make it, it's every man for themselves, or, or you must help yourself, or if you don't look out for number one, you're going to kind of get pushed to the bottom because everyone else is looking out for number one. But here's what's so tricky about evil desires, right? Most of the time, we don't think that our desires are evil. We can see it in other people, but it's really difficult to see evil desires in ourselves because we can't see the evil in ourselves or the evil around us or informing us. And I recently read this phenomenal book called Between the World and Me by Tanashi Coates. And he says this, he's talking about the evil of racism and how it's often so intertwined with the American dream. And that, that, that dream and racism has ultimately exploited minorities to the benefit of white Americans. And most often, it's not really seen by those who are benefiting from it. And he makes this profound observation about evil. He says this, to do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he is doing is good. Or else it is well considered act in conformity with natural law. Like this is just how the world works. He goes on to say, this is the foundation of the dream. Its adherents must not just believe in it, but believe that it is just. Believe that their possession of the dream is the natural result of grit, honor, and good works. There is some passing acknowledgement of the bad old days, which, by the way, were not so bad as to have any ongoing effect on our present. The metal that it takes to look away from the horror of our system, from the long war against the black body, is not forged overnight. This is the practiced habit of jabbing out one's eyes and forgetting the work of one's hands. 
To acknowledge these horrors means turning away from the brightly rendered version of your country as it has always declared itself and turning towards something murkier and unknown. It is still too difficult for most Americans to do this, but this is your work. This is pretty heavy stuff. It's very important to pay attention to because it explains so much about our country and maybe even our lives today. But, but I want you to hear this. The thing about evil desires, when you have them or set your hope on them, you don't actually think they're evil at all. As Coates points out, most often to do or desire, desire evil, you must first believe that the evil is actually good and natural, just and a benefit you deserve for your own hard work and effort. Juan Sanchez, in his commentary on 1 Peter for You, explains it a different way, but he gets to the same thing. He says this, when life gets hard, <clears throat> we are constantly looking for someone or something to place our hope in, to be the answer that will right our lives and give us what we most need. If you are, most want to escape poverty, you set your hope upon education as a way out. If you live in a war-torn country, you may be tempted to set your hope upon immigrating to another safer country to find peace. Perhaps you're a lonely single mother de desiring to be cared for and protected. Your greatest hope could easily rest upon finding a good man. It is only natural that when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, we seek to find that something that will rescue us. And none of these things are bad in themselves. They are all good. But when they become our greatest goal, so that our greatest hope is the thing that will deliver that goal, that thing or that person becomes a functional God or a savior to us. We bow down at their altars, willingly offering whatever sacrifices they may require. When we set our hope on these things, it can become all-consuming. We will compromise. We'll overreach. We will become consumed. We will practice malice, deceit, slander. We will mistreat, overlook, and oppress. Whatever it takes, it may even be surprising to you what you're willing to do. Things that you would have never done. But you want that thing. You need that thing to secure the life you've dreamt of. This is why you lie. This is why you mistreat others. This is why you scheme. This is why jealousy consumes you at times. This is why you can't imagine being happy until you have that thing in your possession. This is why you can't muster anything other than hatred for someone on the opposite side of the political aisle or maybe on the opposite side of the city or the world because you think they're trying to take the power or control away from you. And I can't be wrong because they can't be right. This is why when someone in the last few years or even in the last few weeks has declared Black Lives Matter, because for far too long it seemed like they don't matter, or at least they don't matter as much as white lives, some white person feels compelled to diminish the power of the statement so that they can reiterate just how much their own lives matter. And they'll do all sorts of work to prove that they're right. This is why every real, true, positive opportunity our country walks through turns into an ugly, violent, hate-filled vilification of someone who voices an opposing viewpoint or, or belief. There is no race, no religion, no gender, no party or people group exempt from this when we set our hope on the focus of our evil desires. More power. More control, more people just like me, be it skin color, political ideology, religious beliefs, and less people like them. This is why Peter calls those who know Jesus to be sober-minded. He knows how intoxicating these evil desires can be for us. Think about how drunkenness affects the body. It clouds judgment. It slows reflexes. It provokes us to do what we never thought we would do. This is the impact that following our evil desires has on our hearts and our minds. Sadly, in our own strength, in our own understanding, our hope as human beings is naturally set on these things. Like our desires become evil as we rely on our ability to secure them. And it produces in us the kind of toxic, destructive behavior Peter calls us to rid our lives of. 
This is what's happening internally that produces evil behavior. If that's what's happening naturally in us, what could be happening in a person that could produce the opposite? That love that is so compelling. The difference comes in where you set your hope. Look again at verse 13. He says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully so sober, set your ho hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Set your hope on the grace brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. This matches up directly with what Peter says in verse 22 and 23. He says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And this is it, verse 23. For you have been born again. I want you to catch a couple of things. The real difference happening inside a person is, is, is this. First, hope that produces sincere, earnest, fervent, intense, pure love is focused and dependent on Jesus. It's about what Jesus is providing and not what we can provide for ourselves. It's about the work of Jesus, what he's done on the cross, what he did through the resurrection, what he wants to do in your heart and in your life to make you new. Second is this, loving this way is just not possible unless you are born again. Your first birth, the, the natural birth that every human experiences, you, you come out striving, fighting, clawing with evil desires full of malice and deceit. You might think, bro, that's pretty hard to talk about birth that way. But if you don't believe me, just look at a group of two-year-olds fighting over a piece of plastic in the middle of a living room. We don't grow out of that. We, we just learn to do it in more socially acceptable ways. A new way of living requires new life. I'll say that again. A new way of living requires new life. This isn't something you can self-generate. You must be born again. All you have to do is confess how broken you are. And how much breaking of others you have done in pursuing your own natural desires and ask to receive forgiveness from Jesus. And you will be born again. You are, as Paul says, a new creation in Christ. Over and over here, Peter refers to God as your father. God is our father. And then he says, uh, he calls us to be holy as God is holy. But the reality is you and I in our own strength can never be holy. You just can't be holy in your humanity. Your holiness comes from Jesus living in you if you're born again. It's like father, like son, because of the work of God's son and his grace that's available to you. This third thing is this. What we expect in the end informs how we love today. What we expect in the end informs how we love today. If you're trying to earn God's favor, you may do good, but it's for your own good which is a selfish good. Trying to earn your way to heaven or earn your way to God's good side. When you have been born again, your fate is already sealed because Jesus has already suffered the consequences of your sin through dying on the cross. And now all that's left for you to do is receive his grace. There's nothing to fear. If your future is already secured in Christ, then your present is secure in him as well. Instead of striving to secure for yourself, you realize that God is provider both now and forever. And so you set your hope on the grace of God. Sanchez again, first Peter for you, he says this, Peter is calling Christians to set our hope on absolute certainty of God and his promises for us in Christ. What we hope in determines how we live now and how we live now demonstrates what we truly hope in. I wonder what your life, how you're living now, tells the watching world what you're hoping in. My mentor and friend, Rick Duncan, he, he's the pastor, founding pastor of Cuyahoga Valley Church. He used to tell me a sermon should consist of four parts. He would say this, what do you want them to know and why do you want them to know it? That's really been the first like 90% of my sermon. What do you want them to know? Why do you want them to know it? And then he would say this, what do you want them to do and why do you want them to do it? So what? What does Peter want us to do? What am I trying to get you to do this morning? This evening, whenever you're watching, given this whole sermon, you might think what I'm trying to do is to get you to be more loving. But that's just a byproduct of where you set your hope. 
It comes out of a heart full of Jesus. So, so what do I want you to do? Let's get back to the last few verses of 1 Peter 2. In verse 2, he says this, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You know how good the Lord is. Right? You know how good the Lord is. He, he saved you from your evil desires and your disastrous life that you've lived. He saved you from judgment by giving you grace through faith. If you have faith in him, you've been born again like a newborn baby needs milk to survive. You too, born of Jesus Christ, need spiritual milk to survive. There's going to be a temptation, no doubt, this week for each of us, watching, listening, talking, me, you, all of us will, will face temptation this week where, where I sense a need, where you sense a need, emotional, physical, relational, spiritual. You're going to face a moment of decision. We're all going to be there this week, maybe even today. And the question will be, do I conform to the evil desires I had when I lived in ignorance? Or do I crave, that's about desire too, do I crave the pure spiritual milk that will grow me up in this new life I have in Christ? You get this pure spiritual milk through Christian fellowship, right? Through reading and memorizing the scriptures, through growing in your understanding of God and who he is, by listening to podcasts or sermons, by reading books, listening to music that is all pointing your heart and your hope to the goodness and grace of God through Jesus Christ. And so what do I want you to do this week? I want you to crave that pure spiritual milk. Right, why do I want you to do it? Well, one, because you have tasted that the Lord is good and it's good for you. But two, by it, you may grow up in your salvation. And a byproduct of that maturity is the love that he's calling us to. And that will be what produces in you that kind of love that someone looks at you and says, What's going on in that person, inside of them, that produces that kind of love and kindness that's so different than everyone else that I encounter? Well, as we close, uh, we're going to worship together here at the end, but I just want you to think through a few things. First, where is your hope set? Where is your hope set, really? And what does your life reveal about what you're hoping in? Have you been born again? Maybe that's a, a big question you need to really consider. Like, am I really a Christian or have I just done Christian things? Have I been born again? Or, or maybe you could ask yourself, what have I been craving? And what's it doing to my heart and my soul, and my mind and my strength? And what would it look like for me to crave Jesus this week?
so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God First John 4, verses 7 through 11. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loves us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Now we're going to join together in communion. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. I'm going to pray for our communion, and then we'll close our service today. Lord, we take this bread and this wine in remembrance of you, that your body was broken and your blood was shed for our sins so that we might not have to pay that penalty, but you went and paid that penalty in our place, that we get to have new life in you. We are so thankful for that opportunity for this relationship with you, and I pray that we would live our lives in remembrance of you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning, and we hope to see you again next week.